All right, welcome to Spotlight at Northern, our regular TV show. I'm Ken Blanchard, professor of government. The other professor of government, the lesser one, is with me here, <laughs> Professor Schaff. We are co-creators of Spotlight. It's been on, what, five years now or oh, so? Longer Something than like that, that. Man, longer I than I've lost that. track. Uh, and uh, our guest today, I welcome uh, Art Marmerstein, professor of history. Uh, and uh, Steve Yusitalo, also professor of history and our resident Bolshevik. And uh, we... Uh, Unless on bull. <laughs> <laughs> the last Bolshevik. The last Bolshevik. The last Bolshevik. <laughs> and we are here today to discuss uh, contemporary politics. Since this is uh, more or less the second time we've had this group, I suppose we can now call ourselves the uh, spotlight group or something like that. But, uh, Sal McLaughlin. Yeah, Indian. exactly. Uh, if you're listening to this on audio on the podcast, it's uh, Wolf Tracks, and I'm the creator of Wolf Tracks, and uh, you, there's lots of other really fun stuff on that. Wolf Tracks uh, at buzzsprout.com, I think, is, is our link. Well, uh, our first topic that we decided to discuss, which by we I mean me, uh, is uh, the president's... Um, age and the problems that he seems to be having as a consequence of that. Um, as you may I think, have... I think Neil Schnorr is doing a bang-up job as president of Northern Oh, I, I think University. he is. I think he is. And <laughs> oh, you meant Joe Biden. Yeah, I did, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Although, Joe Biden might confuse the two. A oh, mm -hmm. little bit of a joke. Well, I'm going to go to Art Marmerstein, since uh, as most of us... Uh, if you know Professor Marmerstein, you know that God actually wore his hand-me-downs. <laughs> uh, so... Um, that's a little joke about is uh, <laughs> only a little. Uh, Professor Marmerstein, uh, you've been uh, following the story, I assume. And I uh, is uh, Joe Biden capable of exercising the office of the president? Um, I'm going to give a weird answer to that. And, and yes, of course, we've had plenty of examples in history of mentally retarded uh, kings who the, the nation ran just fine. King George uh, uh, was, was was mad and the kingdom ran fine. The ministers ran it. And I think that's been what it's uh, been happening. They did with, lose America. Uh, 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 well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, I, I think uh, as a figurehead and other people are really running the show, which has been true from the beginning, it's not that he's gotten any worse. He's, he was, never was in charge uh, uh, there of the show. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I suppose he's capable of being um, uh, a president, but not, uh, uh, I don't think he's uh, going to make any good foreign policy decisions or economic decisions or much of anything. I don't think he's capable of understanding in any depth the issues that are facing the country. But as a figurehead, sure, why not? So Who's the Prince Regent in this? Uh, does that mean Hunter Biden is? No, be that <laughs> is, uh, that's or a is question I would I would really want to know who is really calling the shots yeah. uh, uh, here. I would be I would be somewhat more comf comfortable if I thought there was a Cardinal Richelieu in the background <laughs> who was at least competent. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard to see. It's hard to be confident of that when you, if, you're, if that's what you're doing, you're going to pick a figurehead who's not really going to be running the show. Couldn't you have found a better figurehead? Could you really trust the folks in the background if this is what they choose as their standard bearer, as their public voice? You choose as your public figure somebody who can't go out in public. Um, there was a rather devastating piece by Nate Silver um, who runs numbers and makes projections on elections and that sort of thing about the president. And he pointed out how bad it was that, that Biden had skipped the Super Bowl interview because it's about as easy a venue as somebody could probably make. And it's hard not to interpret that as his staff can't trust him to be on camera for more than two, two seconds. Um, and that clearly is hurting him in terms of his public uh, persona. Uh, Professor Yusitalo, what can you... Uh... Well, you know, as, as, my, as a new fanboy of Bill Crystal here, who talked about this the other day, one of the things he actually did point out, if you compare the numbers, this is actually extremely similar to Reagan's second term, Biden's first term, the number of press conferences, that extremely tightly controlled White House operation, second term Reagan, first term Biden, rarely letting them go out. Of course, we know that Reagan was sinking into senility at the end of his second term. 
maybe Biden is ha- facing these same kind of, but the problem is they did choose to run Reagan again against Mondale in 84, even though there were clear signs of cognitive decline in 84. That's, the evidence was, is there. I don't know yep. that, that people who know Reagan very well, including Professor Blanchard's old grad school buddy, Stephen yep. Hayward, argue that the first signs of actual dementia were four years after he left. See, that's a, the, the president. Pro- you're right, you're right. I've, and I saw it from Peter, Peter Robinson is this, the, the uh, speech writer who wrote, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. He was working in the White House. You know, it, was, it was after. You know, you're 100, you know, you know, John, you, that's, that's sort of the point is it. It's, it's almost, I mean, he was probably slowing down for other reasons. Yeah. It's, yeah. But that's a part of the problem with the Biden. Is it's almost impossible to decipher the issues of cognitive decline because you're going to get everybody who's close to Biden saying, no, he's not suffering this. Same with the Reagan. And, and the, the evi- you know, it's, and you're getting a report on a, he's the, the special counsel who wrote the report is really not qualified to make neurological diagnoses based on like, whether Biden sure. is. And no, so but he's qualified to say that he didn't seem to be able to talk. You know, that, here's I the mean, thing about Biden. Biden, even in the 70s, because of the stammering issue that he was treated for for so many years. Biden's always had this, if you listen to his speech in the 70s, he, it was disconnected as well. They weren't, they weren't he, had, he had speech impediments always going back at the time. I'm not saying, that, I'm not saying he, he's, he's not suffering cognitive decline, and I think it's an issue that should be raised. I mean, he's a public figure, he's running for president. But I'm just, I just think the evidence isn't quite there yet. I think if I saw a video the other day of Biden, I think at a debate in 2020. Yeah. And boy, does he look different. Yeah. Just four years, four years different. Anybody, you know, those of us who I've been following national politics relatively closely for 40 years. Um, I started when I was minus five. Um, and uh, Joe Biden's been on the scene that whole time. Yeah. And you can tell there's a decline. I will say that this stammer thing. I did not know that Joe Biden had a stammer or a stutter till like two years ago. Uh, so he must have hit it pretty well. Uh, yeah. I never noticed it. I think to one of Ken's questions about if you were just going to have a figurehead in when there's you know, the puppet masters behind the scenes, wouldn't you pick a more obvious puppet? Uh, I mean, a, a more competent, by what I, I mean, a more competent looking puppet than than Joe Biden. I don't know. He was available. He was electable. They, they, I think, made a calculation, perhaps have made a calculation again, that the, on pure electoral politics, uh, leaving everything else aside, the choice before the country is a, is a binary. It's a Trump, not Trump. Yeah. And not Trump will win, no matter who it is. They might be testing that this year, uh, but I think that that was their you needed just a credible yeah. not Trump, and Joe Biden was the most credible not Trump uh, in in 2020. Um, I, I actually disagree with that, but I, I, I bet that's what they were thinking. Because uh, I, I like I, I, Amy Klobuchar was the best person who ran for president for the Democrats, but um, they maybe they've made that same calculation. We just needed not Trump, and he's yeah. he's electable enough and. Somewhere in November, we'll find out whether that's sure. whether that's true. It, it worked not. to 20, 2020, but you know, it didn't work for Hillary Clinton, right? Because that's nope. same, yeah. So that's the problem. Is this, so, yep. this going to be a twenty sixteen well, all I, over the, again? The problem with Clinton is Clinton took it too much for granted. Yeah. Whereas Biden didn't do a lot of work in twenty twenty, but the extent they could, and of course, a weird COVID election, his team did work. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The Democrats and the Biden team did the work necessary to get him across. The, uh, the goal line where Hillary Clinton did one of those famous like NFL videos where the guy's you know, running towards the end zone and he spikes the ball at the one yard line, not realizing he's <laughs> not in the end zone yet. Um, and oh, you just fumbled the ball. Uh, and so she was spiking the ball yeah. early, as they say, and sort of you know, try to coast to a, a victory she thought was assured. Yeah. Well, I think your and analysis that didn't happen, did it? Yeah. is convincing for the yeah. 2016 election. I mean. In the 2016 election, he still seemed like he could remember what he had for breakfast. You and mean, are you he, talking about Biden? Biden. You mean 2016 or 2020? I'm talking now about 2016. Okay, yeah. I think it, your analysis applies to that. Why did they choose Biden at that point? He had the prestige of being the vice president. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to continue out the... Um, uh, no, I was talking about 2020, but anyway. Yeah, anyway, yeah. That's he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to play out his... Um, Mm-hmm. That sort of prestige, and that that gave him some advantage, but now, 
with 2024, you think at some point along the line, you would have looked at this candidate and said, we can beat, surely we can beat Trump with somebody else. And surely there's somebody else who'd be a much safer bet. So it does seem to me to suggest that it's not just Biden, it is the people behind Biden that are not competent to put together an operation. And again, to go to, to Silver's comment, you've got, you know, when it's clear, this is clearly a political liability for him, that people doubt him. You have two choices. You keep him behind, the, 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 you keep him in his basement like you did in 2020 and make, and that may work for you, but it just confirms the general impression everybody has. Or you bring him out, and obviously they don't trust him to be in front of the camera. And that does, it just seems to me strange the, in this powerful republic that this is one of the two candidates. We can talk about the problems, and maybe that's maybe the next show, the, the, you know, how much we don't like Trump. But one before, very quickly before I go on, the press does one, Biden one big favor. They've kept the focus on the question of, you know, is he really senile? I mean, is he really losing his marbles in a, in, a, in a big way. The problem with that is it ignores the sort of all the other stuff that you have to worry about in the presidency. What if we have a, something comparable to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the chief executive with the button in front of him has to sit there for 12 hours watching screens and listening to reports? Can he do that? Is anybody in their right mind think Biden could last more than three hours in a high well, I don't you know, know. What the well, I, see, I, I think people make up their minds on candidates, and it is very yeah. hard for them to change their mind, regardless yeah. of the evidence in, in front of them. There's an Ionesco play called The Leader, in which um, they, they build up all this enthusiasm for the, for the leader, and the leader is coming, and the leader is coming, and the leader is coming, and finally the leader appears, and somebody says, oh, the leader has no head! And everybody angrily turns and says, what's that got to do with it? He's still the, the leader. Leader. But there is a dangerous moment. You can keep that momentum going as long as there's a consensus and everybody is saying that the emperor is, oh, look at the beautiful clothes the emperor has. has. It is the moment at which somebody says the emperor doesn't have any clothes on and Biden is closing in on that moment. Now, they, the Republicans and everybody, well, the, the, that's rather objective. Biden was not able to carry out the presidency. It was obviously in cognitive decline be, it, during the last election. But his supporters didn't, uh, didn't uh, say that. Now it's the people that are around him that are beginning to doubt. And in politics, I'm as not you positive know, they're, willing can, they're doubting the art. What? I'm not positive of the people around Biden. I Some, think, yeah, because in, in tw in the, like, you look at 1944. Right. So much stuff. You look at Roosevelt was in clear decline. They just he wanted he was Henry. Told he was dying by his own doctor. He was in Henry, Henry Wallace was his vice president. They decided he was too radical. Roosevelt wanted William O. Douglas. That was his candidate. They said no, no way. We're picking a safe candidate. It's Harry Truman because right. he, they didn't think he'd survive, and he didn't. Right. God shines on <laughs> drunks, fools in the United by the way, States this, of America. This builds <laughs> up into your party boss thing that you gave today, which yes. is maybe there's some advantage to party bosses. Thank, thank God but, for but, party bosses and Harry Truman where <laughs> compared I was to go, the alternatives. Where I was going to go with this is <laughs> that the change comes in a hurry like the French Revolution turning on Robespierre for very yeah. different reasons. Yeah. But how quickly did that change yeah. uh, change come? And that happens, I think, with other uh, other things as well. And so with Biden, it's kind of, well, will they be able to carry the current momentum of, of people who have made up their minds on Biden already? Can his handlers get past the, uh, uh, the election? And they're beginning to worry, I think, that they're not going to be able to sustain, uh, sustain yeah. that. I think I'll, I'll make a slight disagreement with Art. I don't really actually yeah. disagree with all that analysis other than how do you interpret what, what, how, what the people think of Biden, because I think they're actually at that point. Now, we've seen two polls in the last couple weeks that have high 70s to low 80s of the American people think that Biden is not physically, mentally capable of doing the job of president. You can't get, especially, you can't get 80% of the American public to agree the sky is blue. I mean, and this is where they're at on something political. Yeah. Um, the question is, does it matter? Yeah. Um, are they willing to say, okay, we know he's not really capable of being the job, of doing the job, but we dislike Trump more. You know, and so it, it's, I think the real question, when you look at this, this, I'm starting to think that this election might look a lot like 2022. Mm. You look at all the numbers, and you know, when we did 
uh, was that in the, that was in the library. We didn't do a spotlight that when the three of us did yeah. a, a pre-election thing and Stephen got everything right and we were both wrong because what Ken and I did is we looked at all the numbers and went, for the love of Pete, there's no way the Democrats can withstand this. This is going to be a red wave. Mm. And it didn't happen uh, because it didn't matter that Republicans were ahead on every single issue, include the most important issues. The country hates Donald Trump. Yeah. And the more Trump and Trump sort of got reintroduced into the campaign in various ways right toward the end. And I think it, you know, it served as kind of a dike on that yeah. red wave. Yep. And I wonder if the same thing won't happen, he, won't happen here. It doesn't matter that because you know, I don't want to get too much into Trump because it's not really the subject. You are kind of caught in this in this devil's bargain between, you know, if you want, I'll put this crudely. I don't really mean this, but the senile one and the crooked one. Um, but you know, what's amazing is how badly Biden looks on all the issues. He's running for re-election. How awful his own numbers are, and 80% of the American people are not even sure he's capable of doing the basic job, and he's down by one and a half. Yeah, that's kind of amazing because he should be getting his brains beat in. Yeah, uh, he should have no business being even in the ballpark with the Republican nominee and the Republicans in their infinite wisdom have managed to nominate probably uh, the one person that, that, this, that this guy could be. I, I have no be. doubt if Nikki Haley, whatever else you think of it, if you don't like Nikki Haley, you don't like Nikki Haley. But if she was the nominee, I think you'd be looking at like 1980 Reagan versus Carter electoral college numbers. If you, have, if you have Tim Scott, you'd be looking at even oh, stronger numbers. Almost anybody else. Yeah. Not, all, not anybody else, but almost anybody yeah. else. I think you're looking yeah. at a pretty comfortable win. Yeah. But that's what Republican analysis would have said about Mitt Romney as the nominee. It's what they would have said about John McCain as the nominee. Oh, here, here is a winner can, uh, candidate. And of course, all sorts of favorable press yep. from, the, uh, from the side that really wants the Democrats anyway. Yeah. Here's a Republican we well, could vote for, but then they fair. won't vote for the Republican. I think... I don't think McCain could have won that election, uh, or at least it was a super long shot. And Romney really did almost win. Talk about yeah. a guy who didn't have ground game. Yeah. Uh, Romney could have won that election uh, against Obama, and Obama people outworked them, yeah. and they outstrategized the Romney people, and they got their vote out, and the Romney people did not. Obviously, Ohio was the classic yeah. example of that. Romney should have won Ohio, and they blew it. Uh, but though I think your greater point, I, I understand your greater, your greater point, but I think in this electoral uh, situation where you're not running against Barack Obama, who, again, whatever you can say about Barack Obama, pretty good campaigner, um, in this electoral situation, I think today's equivalent of Mitt Romney, which might be Mitt Romney, but it's not really, the, that version of, of a Republican candidate is winning this election is, is there, handily. Uh, but to have the Republicans picked up their ground game at all? I, no, I mean, in fact, it's gotten worse. Yeah, so, I, I mean, it, they, the ground game is still for, there for the Democrats. They've got all sorts of money, I think. I, I, what's, money. Uh, what is the money difference between the Republicans well, and Democrats at the presidential election? I don't know election? what the number is off, off the top of my head. The RNC, Republican National Committee, Democratic National Committee numbers, are it's like two to one, if not even worse uh, than that. And the problem is, even to the extent Trump is raising money, he's spending a lot of that on his legal team. He's not, he's, he's not, he's not, he's not building grassroots operations and get out the vote operations. He's doing other things, as is they are. Even to the extent the Republican National Party has money, they've been spending on things like media consultants and ad buys and you know, these the, sorts of things instead of the, the, building electoral infrastructure to get your dang vote out. Whether the basic principles of democratic government. Elections are won by who shows up. It's not who has the most support, it's who shows up. Do you and think do Democrats you think, do you, are gonna get their people out? Do you think economic, you know, because whatever else you might, you know, people are arguing, I don't think he'll do it, but the infrastructure bill was extremely popular when Biden passed, it yeah. went through. The economy's doing fairly well. Jobs, are, at least jobs are being created. Yeah. You know, I know people In are gonna government. question that. It's not just no, government GDP jobs. GDP numbers are good. You know, a lot of people GDP I know in private industry, Ken, in the cities, they're doing better than they've ever done. 
They're great jobs. Jobs are plentiful. Very they can few find of those jobs are anything like manufacturing. Yeah, most but those right. jobs are minority. Out. Those most jobs. Kim, I grew up in an industri industrial area. All, those jobs all, are gone for thirty almost years. Almost all ago, the jobs 40 years created ago. have been in government or healthcare. Yeah, but it now doesn't matter. The jobs well, still. I think <laughs> Stephen is right on. But I can marry what Stephen's saying to what Art was saying a little bit ago about you know, things get baked in the cake. Yeah. I think it's baked in the cake that the Biden economy is a bad economy. Whether it's true or not, I think that's yeah, the I basic agree. The thought. narrative is there. And, and, yeah. and, and the main yeah. problem is I think that inflation narrative is sort of yeah. sunk into people's head with, which, which, with the additional problem that it's true. Yeah. Uh, inflation is still high. And then because of inflation, interest rates are high. Uh, so it's like hard to buy housing, cars, that sort of thing. And that makes people grumpy. Even Chicken. If I, it's, it's food, yeah. Um, even if I think it, it, when it is true that GDP numbers have been robust, uh, our growth numbers have been pretty good the last handful of months. But I have a feeling it's a little bit too late because well, I think in the public consciousness, it's the, it's baked into the cake that Biden economy equals bad. But yeah. but uh, yeah. it, it, whether it's, that's true or not, the economy is good. The economy is good for the relatively elite of this uh, country. Oh, it yeah. is not yep. good for it is not good at all for the people that prospered under the Trump uh, Trump economy. And it isn't it, the idea of that. Oh well, inflation is under control. It doesn't matter. The inflation is 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 there. It's all I, you know. You can see this every time you go to the grocery store. It doesn't matter if its prices aren't continuing to rise. They're a They've lot higher than you know. Yeah. They're a lot Lot higher than they were that's before. Wages are not going up. And wages we're following. have gone up. That's uh, what they wages generally have gone. I mean, I, they haven't gone up uniformly, but in most places, wages are higher than they've ever been before. Still, last month's inflation was three point one percent, which is still not great. No, it's not great. That's still not great. Uh, but you're right. It's the perception. But the perception, but, I mean, right. the perception okay. is there. The, the working class, ever since 1971, the working cl uh, class has been losing uh, wealth. You can watch the, the, uh, the percentage of income. Its uh, wages are flat over a long, uh, long, long time for working class uh, Americans. Well, GNP has, yes, GNP has gone up throughout that, um, uh, that period. Uh, but what happens is working class people get hit, hit on both ends of the in, uh, uh, inflation. They get hit by the inflation first because the last thing to go up, always the last thing to go up is wages. You get asset prices going up, you get prices going up, and finally wages get up, and then every single time wages start catching up, the Fed worries about inflation, slams on the brakes. They do not define, the Fed does not define inflation as the things that you and I would define as inflation, things like cost of university edu uh, education, cost of food, and all that. They don't define it that way. Essentially, what the Fed is doing, whether they say so or not, they have defined inflation by Wages and when wages go, they slam on the brakes as they're doing right now. They you know, up go the interest rates, and uh, as interest rates go up again, working class people lose ground. Not just in terms of wages, but they lose ground in terms of what uh, uh, of wealth. And that wealth gap yeah. is far more concerning in a way because uh, working class people cannot acquire wealth in the way that they could even ten years ago. But I'm, uh, I'm wondering, Art, though, uh, the, the disappearing working class, which is been disappearing for 40 years in the U.S. They've n they're not Democrats anymore. They have, right. uh, haven't been. It's uh, Republicans have become a, the Democrats have become a party which is based largely on education. Right. If you're educated, you live in urban areas. You're Democrat. Plus African American. African votes. Americans so and not even coalition. Hispanic votes anymore. Right. There's two splits. We'll see. It's going to be We'll see how that yep. goes. Yeah. And the Republicans have sort of you know how do you explain areas like the Iron Range has suddenly shifted up to 65 years into being solidly Republican right now. Right. That's as yeah. working class as you can get. I think that's yeah. You so know? we're well we ha we it seems to me we have. We've sort of decided that the economy doesn't really matter uh, because it's really good, but the economy is really bad. So it, it really uh, this seems to be the, our, our conclusion here. Um, I would um, yeah. let's 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 move on a little bit. We've been uh, dumping on Biden enough. Let's talk about Trump and his uh, rather uh, remarkable uh, comment about NATO. As many people watching us may know, he. Well, it's in, it, it, it's there. It, it, what did he say, John? Help me with this. What did the what did Trump actually say I, about the, NATO? The thing that got if, if if we're talking about the same thing when he said that when he was president, right, right, that he went to a NATO conference and said, if you guys don't start poning up your fair share, the other NATO members, of course, 
uh, I mean, your fair share of defense dollars. Uh, and I think, is everybody else in NATO or almost everybody else in NATO below where they're supposed to be in, in I don't know how they calculate if it's percentage of budget or percentage They got about 10 of, countries that are above 2%. Percent. Okay. Ten, 10 countries. And the out, rest out of how many members in NATO so are like there? Like 28 or 29, 28, okay. um, something like that. And, well, anyway, so you guys aren't pulling your fair share. Yeah. You're not pulling weight. And, you know, if Russia invades, we're not going to help you. In fact, I might tell them to invade. I'm paraphrasing. This is not yes. his exact quote, but it's, it was words to this effect. In fact, I might tell Putin to invade you guys. <laughs> and then his claim is, and then they started, then they started paying their fair share. That a number of these countries yeah. uh, up there, uh, up there, uh, uh, their, def their defense spending again. I think is it two percent of the economy? GNP, I think it's yeah. what it is. Yeah, and it's GDP. a percentage yeah. of GDP they're supposed to spend yeah. on defense. And yeah. and yeah, but of course that's not how the press reported it, right? Almost universally they reported Trump says he's going to kick, you know, he's going to leave NATO and and tell Putin he can do anything he wants in these countries. In other words, as if it's what he's going to do next time, which, as far as I can tell, is not what he said. Uh, but then the question becomes, is it useful to talk like that? Um, I, uh, I, what I find most interesting about that story is that it shows that Trump's opposition, in the press in particular, has no idea why Trump is popular, why he's got the following that he does. Saying something like that is saying, like, you know, there are an awful lot of people out there, again, rightly or wrongly, perceptions and politics is what matters, who think the United States has taken advantage of, that we go, to, we go out and save the world again and again, and nobody else ponies up their share. And Trump says, I'm going to make them pony up their share. To an awful lot of Americans, that's music in their ears. It's exactly what they want to hear. Mm, right. And yet, the Washington Post, which hates, loathes Trump, has no idea that they're actually building him up when they over and over again repeat this state about NATO. Now, NATO's important. Trump's not going to take us out of NATO. Uh, he shouldn't take us out of NATO. Um, so, I, well, I don't know, Steve. I what? don't know. I mean, you know, it wasn't Trump's rhetoric that got those countries. It was Russia's invasion of Ukraine that caused the massive increase in defense spending. Poland doubled their defense budget. So Poland, Lithuania, Estonia, these countries are above two to three. Poland's at five. Finland's at five percent because of the fear of Russia, right? So that's what's really increased. I do think, it, you know, the pro, you know, there are countries that have, are below two percent. They've they've depended on U.S. Su support. It's a good political tool. I think they are right that the Germans, the French, Canadians are at one point four percent. They're way below two percent on that. They could increase. They should probably contribute more. In all those countries, it's an issue. But it does enormous dislocations to your economy when you suddenly have a massive increase in defense spending. So that, that's the, but I do agree it is an effective tool. You know, Trump's probably not going to bring us out of NATO. Although the, in this recent book by Jonathan Carl about Trump's last time, who's been interviewing Trump for 35 years, he said at the very end there, was a lot, there were a lot of people in Trump's White House who wanted to pull the U.S. out of NATO. So I'm not convinced he won't pull the U.S. out of NATO. I think that it, it, it'll play out with the Russian. With the Ru Russia, Russia seems to have won the war in Ukraine. They seem to, you know, this last defeat is devastating for the Ukrainians. They've replaced their leadership. The president's pl plummeting in popularity, Zelensky. And, and American aid is too little too late. And, may, and, and the question is, should more aid be given to a I mean, it's a well, terrible way. we just way. passed it. Well, I guess I, it's, well, it may it, never pass the House. It, so we'll it, it's a terrible happens. calculus. Should you, should you stop aid to a country that's losing? Yeah. But yeah. another end, you know. It, well, this is the, though. This is this is Trump's technique. Uh, Trump, for all the press uh, talks about him as a perennial liar, Trump has a, there's a yeah, method to his yeah. madness. He overstates things all the time, yeah. and because he overstates things. He knows the press is hostile to him, yeah. so the press will say, "Well, you know, you didn't inc uh, in increase the economy by uh, ten percent like you just claimed. You only increased it by two percent." Well, what did they just say? They just said he increased the economy by two percent. And Trump here with the uh, comments, no, he knows the press is going to misinterpret him, but his those people that support him are going to understand yeah. full yeah. well. Yeah, all right, this NATO. What has NATO been doing for us recently? NATO was quite good during the Cold War period. 
Cold War came to an end in 1991. What's NATO done for us more recently? Well, uh, what's NATO doing in uh, what's NATO doing in Libya? Why did we overthrow uh, Gaddafi? What was going on there? Why were we in Syria? Why did we create five million dollar uh, you know f five million refu uh, refugees refugees that are all over the place creating uh, problems? And the big question that Trump is going to have: What's going on with spending money uh, on um, uh, on Ukraine when we can't even spend Spend money to close our borders, and that's going to be what Trump is going to uh, the, say. The only, the only are danger I would yeah. say to that is that in 2014, I might have made the NATO argument, but now I think the evidence is fairly clear that you have a murderer running the Kremlin. He's a brutal figure who will be emboldened. Well, that's a change, isn't it? <laughs> he will be. No, I mean the, the way he. The way, Putin's changed in eight years dramatically. He's, he, something's happened with his rule where he's, the little opposition that he had, he's completely eliminated it. It's always existed. It doesn't exist. Two million Russians have fled the country. Uh, I think he will be emboldened by a def you defeated Ukraine. I think his ambitions will not. I used to think he would be stopped. I don't think he will anymore. I think he'll look to Georgia and the Baltic republics next. And there's no evidence he will the do Baltics anything. Baltics are NATO members. I know. But I'm, I'm not convinced NATO is going to go to war with Russia to protect the Baltics, even though it's part of their treaty obligations. You know, that's a big step to sort Well, of if that's the case, then we ought to go out of NATO because it's I'm, useless. Because it's never been tested, though, well, has it? That's NATO's true. never been tested. Well, whether, are we going to go to war over Romania? And are we going to go to war over, you know... Uh, yeah. Just even throwing out the Cold War golden oldies. Well, I mean... Uh, it's true. Wait, it's well, the, to me, it's, it's why you don't. The, the problem with Trump's rhetoric... Uh, I, I wish that Donald Trump was playing the Machiavellian 3D chess that, that, uh, that, that art ascribes to him. I'd be, imp I'd be more impressed. Uh, I, my suspicion is he was, he's just blowing his mouth off and maybe has stumbled into something that could have some sort of strategic uh, use to it. Uh, I think it's more of an expression of his narcissism and his, the way he creates fables in his head. Because also the, the, the discussion that he's talking about almost certainly never happened. Uh, he's exaggerating at, at a minimum, is you do have a problem. When, when you say things like, maybe I will let Putin, I realize he was talking in the past tense, no, not the future mm -hmm. tense, but you do have a madman in the Kremlin, uh, a hegemon, mm -hmm. who has shown that he is willing to use violence and war to expand his empire. Any indication that you would be amenable to his furthering that expansion is incredibly foolish. Yes, but and, promising and he's, people... He's, he, is, he is buying trouble, which is what, which is what Trump does, yeah. right? Is he gets himself, he lets his big mouth get him into trouble. I think and that's... This is, this is... And I realize, uh, last thing, um, we've been saying all along that perception uh, it maybe isn't everything, but it's a whole boom and lot uh, of politics. At some point, a, a group of academics uh, should at least sort of try to say what's true, not just, uh, not just what is perceived to be true. And this is not the way a statesman acts. It's not clever. It's not, it's not even Machiavellian. It is a blowhard who is, through his big mouth, is going to get you. you. You don't want a shooting war. You need someone who has discipline and control. right? A Machiavellian might show bluster, but is in control the whole time. He knows it's a show. I don't think Trump knows okay, it's a show because it's yeah. not really but go back. a show. Yeah. All right. Judge Trump, right. He has no discipline. Judge Trump, not by what one supposes he might do in a second term, but what he actually did do mm -hmm. in the first term. Yeah. We were not in Syria. We were not in, um, in, in Libya. We were not bombing yeah. uh, Kosovo. We were not doing any of those things. The first president in a long, long time not to get us involved in expensive uh, foreign conflicts. And under Trump, what did we get? We got the Abraham Accords. It looked for the first time in a long time like we may have a real Real, uh, real peace and a final settlement between the, uh, the uh, Jews and their Muslim uh, uh, neighbors. If, if you come to what actually happened in foreign policy during the Trump administration, regardless of the bluster, and yes, the bluster was uh, there, but the foreign policy result was a good one. Yeah, um, I would I, add I, I, to note, he did almost bluster us into a trade war with China. And yeah. ask, ask South Dakota farmers how much they like 2017. Mm -hmm. 
right, when, when the Chinese stopped buying I, American soybeans. Trump's right? narcissism, like the, as you describe it, though, the, what, what kinds of things does he think make him look good? I think the NATO comment, is, I think it's very hard to criticize, in fact, precisely because nobody thought he was really going to do it back then, and they don't think he's going to do it now. Whether the conversation happened or not, did he give the, um, our NATO allies the impression that they needed to pony up? And did he use leverage to do it? That's what he was bragging about, whether it happened or not. That's the kind of thing that he was bragging about. And precisely but because he's delusional. Well, precisely because we've got this guy, this guy Putin in Russia, you might want to make sure your allies do pony up because we might not be able to come up with the resources all by ourselves. And if you can use leverage to get them, there's some increase. I think it, it began before Ukraine, but certainly that it's, it, it, it's increased significantly past that point. Um, but that basic argument, again, I think it makes him, to most people, it makes him look good. They said to the, he said to these folks, you want our protection? Okay, you're going to have to do your part. We're not just, we're not going to promise you that we're going to save you even if you're act completely irresponsibly. The kinds of things that I find absolutely inexcusable, comments like is, you know, uh, poisoning our, the, the immigrants are poisoning our blood. Yeah. I mean, that is such a vicious sort of thing to say, and it so discredits what otherwise is a reasonable his, his position on immigration. Yeah, but you, know, you wonder with that. I mean, you guys know these. These you've looked at. Is anybody going to vote? I mean, a, a handful of people. Or is there going to be any subs real vote swings based on foreign abstract foreign mm -hmm. policy? Uh, you know. So we let's. But immigration, on the other hand, maybe. That might have some some. Uh, immigration might, but I still think that 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 general idea that a lot of people have that we are taking advantage of in terms of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. not, and not an actual policy in the sense of this is what we're going to do about Ukraine, but in a general sort of we're not going to, we're mad at someone, we're not going to take it anymore sort of attitude from Trump on yeah. foreign policy might make a difference. But I agree completely that the immigration, that's clearly Trump's uh, whole, uh, that's his most important asset in the election and it's, it's Biden's greatest weakness. And uh, if it's if the election's about immigration, I was looking at uh, looking at our globe here. It's an old globe. Ukraine is still part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, and maybe yet again, no. uh, uh, if not exactly under that name. <laughs> but, but let me let me ask you something about immigration, because you guys, it's been you know the first time I remember it was when I was an undergraduate during Reagan when they gave amnesty for I can't remember the details yeah. mm -hmm. what, what happened in the 80s. So this has been obviously an issue for decades, long before the 80s. Right. So essentially, what I d don't like. What what is the Biden policy? On is there one? There's a, is there is there a policy on immigration? You know, Jonah Goldberg. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't the, know. The, the, the pundit had always said, uh, "My favored immigration policy is to have one." Yeah. Uh, should we have more immigration, less immigration? This number of temporary vi we just visas, have that number of temporary <laughs> visas. Can we just like pick a number yeah. and go with it? Uh, and, yeah. uh, I might be more restrictionist. Some of you might be more uh, might more, might be more open. But can we just like have a policy? Whereas it does seem the policy. Uh, maybe I mean this is I, I actually agree with Art that at least vis-a-vis -vis the Middle East and uh, the, the the Trump presidency was very successful. I think maybe the best success of the mm -hmm. Trump presidency was Middle East foreign policy, both in what he did and then what as you quite accurately put it, what he didn't do. And the best success, uh, I think, since Jimmy Carter. Oh, in terms of actually moving absolutely. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I'm, I don't know that even under Trump, he, I think there was an opportunity to do some, something on immigration. He himself, I mean, was so, this is part of the, the problem of Trump, he's so ham-fisted uh, and schizophrenic about it. They, they didn't they didn't get anything done, and I, they, they did totally misused the two years they had united yeah. Republican governance, which, again, many people would say they would have used for ill, but they would have done something on this issue. Like, so they w there would have been a policy, and we just keep pussyfooting around. And now I think what it, it's, it's become this political football, whereas everybody now has this interest in, in not doing anything so they can blame the other yeah. side for not yeah. doing anything, and I guess we're going to see which side wins this, this match, and I, I'll do the cliche, and I know who's losing, it's the United States of America, uh, as these guys try to, try to, they're not even trying to save face, they're trying to, they're, they're trying to darken the face of the other, they're trying to throw mud in the face of the other person, that they're the ones who are, the, are why we don't have, so even like you have, you have Mike Johnson, our, our uh, Speaker of the House, 
being for a bill one week and then against it the next week, right? Depending on what Ukraine is, because he he doesn't want to. And he's got his own problems in his in his caucus. But uh, one problem they have they they have difficulty coming to 218. Mm. Um, but taking both sides of an issue, or even you know, it just was it yesterday. Biden said, "Well, I might I might do this executive order," and the Republicans are like, "We told you you could have done this you know a year ago." You don't even need us. You you don't have to say I could do this on my own. They we agree. But we I'm already have John, the power. Is there we don't any, really need is there any like I just I, is there any will? I mean, I get the rhetoric on both sides, but is there any actual will to limit immigration? Because otherwise, I mean, it's not that difficult in logistical terms. I mean, I see the other day yet when they're when they're interviewing somebody who counted 700 Chinese migrants a day passing through past the border guards as they walk standing there in Texas or where in Texas okay. 700 a day, and they're basically they take their number, give them an issue a court order to maybe appear in an immigration court in three months time. Which they'll never. So See I mean, you are you telling me it's really that difficult we in have, practice? We have, for all practical purposes, an, an open, open border. border. Yeah. And Trump. Well, that's they don't another have the infrastructure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, there's an there's an old old Reagan line, right? Uh, it's simple, but it isn't easy. It's a simple problem. Yeah. What you need is more judges, more border yeah. patrol, right? You need yeah. more personnel down there yeah. to process all of these people. More more holding areas for all these people. You need more of that. But politically, it's, it's, so it's a simple solution, but it's not politically very easy to do. But I interrupted but you. But I, no, I was just going to say that Trump had a, Trump was one of the f first presidents in my life and it actually seemed to start getting control of the border. And it was, it was actually pretty easy. Just tell them they have to wait in Mexico. Yeah. We'll give you a yeah. call. And of course, the Washington Post thinks this is tantamount to well, genocide. A, a, um, massive blunder on the part of the Biden administration. I'm trying to remember if it was Biden himself that basically announced, yeah. right, when we take over the White House, I, I don't, they, obviously they didn't use the term open border, but they basically said we're not really going to enforce the border. And the flood. And we're going to welcome all these people from Central America. And well, there's really no, surprise, like, surprise. when it's such a patchwork, like some states in Minnesota, you, an undocumented immigrant can still get a driver's license and all these. So, yeah. if, so there's really, you're not sending any signals that you should deter immigration if it's just every state has its own rules on every, um, on, you know, all these sanctuary states to a degree. So it's essentially, I mean, what, what's, the, what's the deterrence? Well, I think you're going to find out. You know, like, you know, the, the, the mayor of New York City, Mr. Adams, yeah. is getting an edumacation. Uh, yes. In what sanctuary city really looks like, and he doesn't like it. Uh, yeah. He's. Uh, I wonder the like, the the first uh, undocumented alien, as you so politically correct, correctly put it, <laughs> uh, first with a driver's license who y'all you know, commits vehicular manslaughter. Uh, yeah. And I'm, it's not like there's a big connection, but I'm just yeah. saying the things happen. Yeah. Uh, what are people gonna think about that? Uh, you might. I remember if you were. In, I was in Illinois when. The scandal of George Ryan came out uh, when he was Secretary of State, handing out yeah. uh, CDL licenses, yeah. over-the-road licenses yeah. to people who were paying to play, yeah. and it all came a cropper when the wrong guy with a license that he had paid for, not earned, ran over a family <laughs> and killed them. Yet another. In fact, I want to say it was it was uh, immigrants. It was like Bosnian. Immigrants. A long line of Illinois governors going to prison. Yes, that was. Yep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's that was. Uh, <laughs> That was, I'm trying to remember, that, that was pre Blagojevich? Was it probably pre Blagojevich? Yeah, 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 I think it was pre Blagojevich. That was right before Blagojevich. And then, uh, yeah. It's the old the joke days. about the uh, governor's wing in the Illinois prison. <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, when they try, went to arrest Blagojevich, uh, he went quietly, but his hair made a break for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, Can well. I ask you one Biden question, though, that, was, that came up a lot was the Harris question about Biden. Do you think she's a weakness for uh, Biden, or is it irrelevant? The, the, the same thing with foreign policy. People don't really vote on a Vice President, did. no, I don't think they do. You don't think they do? Well, no. I don't think she helps him, no. uh, and to the extent that his his health is a major issue. Let's just say Biden runs, Biden gets reelected. Uh, who here actually thinks he's going to serve yeah. four years as President of the United be, States? He'll be I what sure 80, 87 when he's uh, out. You know. I don't think he's going to make it through four years. Therefore, his vice president is pretty darn important. I still don't think people mm -hmm. vote. Yeah. Uh, on vice president. No, I don't, I don't think that will determine the outcome of the election, but on the, I except for this, that if, if she were a far more attractive candidate, a far more uh, popular candidate, 
it would have been much easier to, to shoo Biden off the stage and mm -hmm. have her run instead. Oh, but, no the, doubt. but she's even. <laughs> of course, the conspiracy people people think that's why you picked her. Oh yeah. Because because she was no threat. Yeah. Oh yeah yeah. I always thought that's why Dan Quayle was the vice president is because Bush needed somebody he could tower over the way Reagan towered over him so I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be too 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 surprised to hear that but uh, no I mean I think they they were they were playing on a I just think the, the Democrats are really lucky right now they're lucky in their enemies but they no conception for why uh, they're having problems why uh, the president is so far below in the polls and I mean you look at the numbers in Michigan uh, yeah. Which you know was a Democratic stronghold for a long time, and now Trump's well, average about five, six points ahead in almost all the polls, and in some as yeah, much as eight or he's ten points. He's outside the margin there in the yeah, so average in Michigan. Yeah, he's. I mean, that's. And these, of course, are the battleground states, um, and we all know that's what's going to determine the outcome, not the the popular vote. Um, I sus. But I also think he's he's got. He's having more trouble than Trump has in unifying his party. I mean, the question was, you know, why is you, you, you meant the Republicans, by in their wisdom, have chosen Trump? Well, Trump has been chosen by Republican voters, by the electorate. He's clearly got a very strong following among ordinary voters. I don't think anybody out there loves Joe Biden, um, and so the problem is then he's got to hold his coalition together in order to defeat Trump. Now. There's just all kinds of signs of problems for that. He can't really be pro-Israel, and he can't really be anti-Israel. Um, he, he can't really no. take a tough stand on immigration, because all those things are going to lose But, you know, it's hard, to hate Biden. it's hard to hate Biden. You know, there are a lot of Democrats who hate Trump and will go to the... I mean, you, can, you, you might have contempt for Biden, or you might think he's unqualified, but there's very little about the man to elicit hate, real well, hatred. Oh, well, I, it depends I don't, on how old I mean, you are. I mean, uh, right, right. I, mean I, I can see... I knew student loan people Are in the you 80s. walked into that one? I, know, well, I, mean, I, I knew people back in the 80s who didn't like Biden because he's the one who passed the inability to get discharged student loans, and he was the senator from Edmund. <laughs> that was the guy. Well, if, if you from, watch... Uh, the credit the credit, credit, these credit these whatever credit card the, company the, was the, based in... the 1980s, right? Yeah. Okay. Those, yeah. Of us, <laughs> those of us whose first real impression of Biden was the Bork hearings and all the... When he is the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, he was so... Na I mean, he introduced a great deal of nastiness into American politics, and particularly uh, Ted Kennedy, I guess you can blame for the, that Bork's America speech, but it was really Biden there. Well, Biden if you're a Democrat, nasty. it's the Anita Hill thing that he fumbled, uh, to when he was he part was of... Chaired, yeah, yeah, so he, he screwed up that one, too. So yeah. it's both sides. Uh, <laughs> it, well, you made everybody mad. You made everybody but, mad on that but, one. But way back to the earlier issue about whether or not Kamala Harris is going to make a, a difference... Um, uh, I think it depends on who Trump chooses as his vice presidential running mate, because then you'll get a comparison of vice presidents. And who knows what kind of, I mean, he might choose an off-the-wall uh, VP candidate. Well, we get a Robert Kennedy or a Tulsi Gabbard or something like that. And how, uh, well, I don't know, what do you think? Uh, would a vice president make well, it? Well, she was uh, floated uh, yesterday uh, as a possibility. Uh, uh, yeah, what would, uh, what would happen if Trump, Trump chooses... Well, I don't know necessarily a good vice presidential candidate, but some that would attract a lot of uh, a lot of attention and maybe a lot of support. It'd be a good question. I mean, somebody like Tulsi Gabbard would be a really bold move. Now, how much Republicans are? He's not going to lose a single Republican over that. But you know, it'd be nice to think ahead. I mean, at most, he's going to have four more years in the White House. It'd be nice to think ahead of somebody who could eventually win election on their own steam. Um, and you know who that's going to be and hard. is 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 hard to is sort of hard to uh, recognize. Because because Trump might not make those four years either. Right. You know he looks we, like an energy full of energy. But we're very close to being out of time <laughs> here. So no. I'm. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm just going to to call this one a wrap. Thank you, Professors Marmerstein, Yusatalo, and you, Ken. Professor Shaw Ken. for uh, appearing again. And uh, we'll be back again probably in a couple of weeks talking about something just as much fun. <laughs>